I'm James Holder. Welcome to Full Call Football 24. Quite privileged to be joined by none other than Hendon manager Lee Allinson. What's happening, Lee? How are you? Very well, mate. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Hope everything's been all right for yourself during lockdown three and not been too testing time for the family, mate. No, we're getting there, mate. It's uh, It's been tough, obviously, but just try to work on yourself kind of thing and, and, and stay fit and healthy. And that's what I've kind of done. Um, you know, just working, working really hard and walking every day. And, and, and that's the best we can do at the moment, mate. Indeed. What's the latest regarding Hendon? Where are you guys at with the football? What's going on? Yes, yeah, so I think we got the decision two days ago or three days ago that the season is now declared null and void, which was, was inevitable, mate, to be honest with you. It was always going to happen when you haven't kicked a ball in anger since uh, latest October, it was always going to happen at that way. So we're, we're null and void. And, and what we have to do now, mate, is, is plan and prepare and, and come back in, you know, end of June, July, ready, hopefully for, for a new season in August. But, you know, we've got to, you know, put some plans in place that this doesn't ever happen again. This is twice now. And, um, you know, clubs are spending money and, and it's not right to keep having the season null and void. Not that you can help it, but, you know, maybe we need to start a little bit earlier in the summer months and have a breakthrough you know, November, December and January if it's going to kick off again and then we can kick off back of the season in, in March time. So hopefully we can find a way, mate, of getting it right so we can finish the season. With no games being played, no fans, no revenue from the bar, this season must have left a huge financial hole for a lot of clubs. How have you guys handled it and do you think there'll be a repercussions from this going forward? Yeah, I mean, massively, I think, you know, I'm very fortunate that I work at a, a very good football club that do things properly. Um, you know, unfortunately, mate, there are clubs that will probably overspend and and, and they're going to struggle probably more than, than other clubs. But I think the main thing in all this is the right decision was made now in null and voiding. You know, at least no one has to spend any money now and they can get it right for, for July. But I think the main thing is that we all come back and, We've learned from this and, and hopefully now that clubs won't under, overspend, if they need to cut back, they'll cut back. The hardest thing for me, you know, and this is what me and my chairman discuss, you know, people have invested money into our club. People have sponsored our club. People have bought season tickets to our club. You know, do they now get paid back? Do, you know, what do you do? You can't ask for, for more sponsorship next year. So you are going to have some losses and that's what every club's going to go through. And it's how we handle that and come back from that. We'll obviously decide where we're going to be in the future. But listen, for supporters and, and football clubs, I think the main thing is it don't matter what you're doing or what you're spending. The main thing is that come July, your football club's there and, and it's ready to go again, no matter what position they're in, that they're healthy and, and well and, and ready to kick on as a football club. And I think that's the main thing. Before we talk about what you're up to currently, I think it's only fair that we look back on your footballing journey. What area did you grow up? Where, where was you brought up in? Yeah, so I was born and bred in Stevenage um, and and started God, football. I mean, it was it was from day dot, really, like literally. I mean, I, it was literally day dot of, of having a football floating around the house, kicking the ball and, and doing what I could uh, to play football. Obviously, growing up in a, in a football family and, and background of a football family. Those that don't know, your dad is obviously Ian Allinson, Arsenal Stoke legend, big, big boots to fill as a young man. What was it like having a footballing dad growing up? Yeah, probably a catch-22, obviously. It's great in some ways, but obviously in other ways quite hard. I think, you know, a lot of opinion out there that was like, you know, you get opportunities because your dad was an ex-footballer. I can assure you it was the other way around. It was the hardest thing ever. He was my biggest critic. Very rarely tell me that I've done well, even when I did do well. You know, he might tell someone else that I've done well, but he'd very rarely tell me. Um, and it was hard. And, you know, listen, from his point of view, my, most humble man he'd ever meet, you know, very rarely talks about what he'd done in his football career and, and what a career he had. But for me, it was probably probably quite tough that I probably had to, I've always probably aimed at that to be like him and, and you know, always wanted to please and always wanted to do well. But at the same time, I was a... I, I was a lazy little shitbag. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, you, you reap what you sow and, and if you're not going to put the effort in. But listen, there was there was some underlying issues in there, which I'm sure we'll touch on in a minute of probably why 
I didn't reach my full potential, especially as a player. And I, I don't want to make that same mistake as a manager. But listen, as a young kid, I, I you know I'm not not trying to blow my own trumpet here, but I, I you know I had a lot of talent, uh, and it's what you do with that talent. I was a very talented player. I'd, I'd live and breathe football, and it's all I knew. And you know, I, I didn't concentrate in score or anything like that because all I wanted to do was play football. And, you know, where you go with that is how you do it. But I, I was a little bit lazy, to be fair. What's your first involvement in football then? How would you have started playing for a local side or playing for the, for yeah, the team? So, how did you start for yourself? Yeah, it's funny because Dad was obviously he grew up in Stevenage himself so he took me to a, a local team which was called Bedwell Rangers um, but I think they took me from sort of four years of age probably just to get me out of the house because I was, I was a raving lunatic as a kid so it was to get me out of the house I suspect but um, and and the earliest memories from that was literally just playing football I just loved it you know I just had every shirt every kit every football every goalie gloves everything that I could get my hands on I had and you know from there as from I can remember from sort of eight nine that then you, you're playing in in the team and I was a centre forward as a kid uh, and I was fortunate that I was you know lucky one in terms of I was probably the goal scorer in a team and always come in with sort of 50 60 goals every season um but at the same time dad had his career and and you know they had a lot of social life mum and dad and Listen, whether that affected me or not, maybe it did um, because, you know, obviously they were out a lot of weekends and I was trying to you know, stay up as long as I could. And, and, and you know, I got to an opportunity. I sort of, it was, I think I got to, um, there was a, like a rep team called East Anglia. So you'd represent like the East of England. And, and I was in that and traveling abroad, um, playing for them. And then I got an opportunity to, to sign for Watford at 11 years of age. And, and, and I signed from that. Starting times for yourself, young boy signing for Watford. What was it like joining Watford's academy at that age? What What was the the coaching team like and the response with yourself? Uh, I this is a tough one for me because I was very I, I loved the street football. I loved going over the park and playing, and and I probably struggled at times to be coached. Probably the fact that who my dad was as well, you know, I'd, I'd hang off every word he said, but I probably didn't hang off every word someone else said. Uh, and it was probably a bit of a detriment to me. And also you've got that scenario where you're training two, three times a week at Watford and playing. And if dad had a game, I'd rather go and watch dad's game, which probably isn't right if you want to be a footballer. But it was great to be a part of, of an academy and of a football club. And, you know, the likes of Ashley Young was in my team. You know, I travel in with Ashley and you go and have a look at the career he's had today. He's, he's done fantastically well. But, you know, he had his, his struggles. But, listen, it, it was great to sign for that the academy. And, and I had other opportunities to go elsewhere. But Watford, for me, at the time was probably right. In, a, in probably a wrong way, like three, or my, three or four of my close friends at the time and family friends who mum and dad were friends with, their son signed at Watford as well, which sounds great, but what well, you got to remember in football, there's, there's, there's no friends in football uh, and everyone's out for their own gain, unfortunately. And, you know, maybe probably the right decision for me back then, uh, uh, mum and dad, they probably should have took me maybe somewhere else and got away from everyone um, because like anything in football, there's jealousy involved from both sides. And there was always that competitiveness and, you know, my son's better than yours. And maybe sometimes I, the only advice I could give, maybe give your son a fresh start somewhere because that was probably quite hard for me um, and a struggle. But, you know, listen, I, I, I had six very good years at Watford, very good years. And, and you know, the last one or two was, was quite tough, but I'll touch on that shortly, why that was probably quite tough. What was Ashley Young like as a youngster? What what was he like at, at the club and around the place? You, you'll be you'll be amazed. He was probably, and this is no disrespect to Ashley. He'll probably say exactly the same. And you know, listen, I'm what an amazing young lad and a oh, man and a career he's had. But he was probably one of the boys that were at the back of, of the club. You know, he he struggled. He wasn't like a standout player whatsoever. Um, he was probably smaller than everyone else and struggled a little bit more. Um, but at 16, when I when I was released, he was he was released as well, but said that he could still come and train at the football club. So it just shows you that you know they they'd let him go. 
but he obviously had a fantastic desire to do well and work ethic and work rate and something that I massively lacked. Um, but he had that. And, you know, listen, the, the story is that he went into Watford, was training, had to go and, and be an extra body at England under 21s who were training on the same facility, done really well in that training session and, and career took off from there. And listen, he's 36 years of age playing for, for Inter Milan. What a, what a story and what a career. And I can honestly say he was he was very much, you know, not the better player at the football club at the time. In our age group, he was, you know, with me because I wasn't doing very well at 15, 16. We were probably at the back end of the group. At that time, at 14, 15, how are you personally? How are you within yourself? How are you around the club? Do you feel that you was maturing and growing into to a decent young man? No, no, not not at all. And I think this is where I'll probably touch now that, you know, only close probably friends and family will know what, you know, I, I suffer really, really badly with OCD. Um, not so much now. I'm in a good place now and I can control it. And it probably makes me a better manager because I, I go over and over and over and over things all the time. So that's my OCD plan up. But Listen, as a kid, it, I, I really struggled and no one will know this other than I say close family and friends. And I think it's only right now that I could probably tell my story and you're giving me the opportunity and the platform to tell this story, you know, because you look back and, and was I lazy or did I actually really suffer? And, and I probably suffered, you know, from the ages of probably 12 um, to, to sort of 17, 18, I, I, my OCD was severe. So when I talk about severe, I mean... I would, every night, it would take me two to three hours a night to go to bed. So that, because all I would do is do checks around the house. I, I'd, I'd check the garage, I'd check the road, I'd check the garden, I'd check that everything was locked and I'd double check everything was locked. I'd walk up and down the stairs 29 times because everything had to be on an odd number, but then it couldn't be on a 13 because that's bad luck. Um, and I, I severely suffered and, you know, I got to a point where at 14, 15, I wouldn't go to bed with fear of having to do my two, three hour check. So as you can imagine, as being a player at Watford, you've got Arsenal on a Sunday morning and I'm not going to bed till four in the morning because I'm frightened to life to have to do two hours of checks every night. Um, so, but back then it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, any common knowledge that had anything wrong with me. It was just like, oh, you've got OCD, it'll be all right, it'll get over it. And I probably never, and it was is until probably the last three, four years, five years, I'd say, that I've really got some help for it and and understood what I was going through and what it was. And, you know, I, I, I did really, really suffer with it. And I think that's probably why I never pursued a career in, you know, football at a higher level. It, put, it could totally control my life back then. Um, you know, I'd even... I'd have opportunities to go abroad and, and go away with football. And, you know, I'd severe, I'd suffer terribly of homesickness, like the worst ever. Uh, and it just kick off an OCD in me. And, you know, I remember mum and dad would go away and I, my, I think my nan would, she took me somewhere and I see a trolley out of place. And, and it drove me that mad that they dropped me home. I think I was about 16 at the time. They dropped me home. I walked three miles to put the trolley back and walked three miles back home just to turn the trolley round because it it was t totally controlled my life that if I'd never done that, that something would happen. And, you know, it's, um, it, it was a really tough time. So actually looking back and I, and I criticised myself and saying I'm lazy, but actually I think I, I really, really struggled. And, you know, it's only now that I can share that story and hope that if anyone is suffering like that, that they can understand that it's not normal and, you know, we're here to help and we can get some out, some help out there, help, hence why, you know, Football Flow and Dean Hooper you've introduced before and interviewed and he's been a huge, huge help for me massively mentally um, because it was, it was bad. It, it was, it was really, really bad. I'm in a, a great place now and, you know, as I say, it probably makes me a better manager. Listen, I've still got me little bits of OCD, I do, but back then it was, it was really bad. So now I was very immature. Um, I really struggled. Uh, I didn't like being away from home. I didn't like, you know, I didn't, I've got to be honest with you, I didn't want to be offered a, a YTS and go into digs. You know, I went on trial at Colchester after I got released from Watford. I played for, I was unbelievable. I was begging the phone call to be no. 
and unfortunate enough for me, it wasn't low. So, but I, that I mean, I would never have survived going into digs. Not not a chance. No way. Um, so it was it was really tough. You know, from the ages about that's probably from ten to to sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Then you you know you start becoming a little bit more mature and growing up. But yeah, for 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 teenage years, it was it was tough. It was really hard. How did you handle the decision that you were going to be let go at Watford? Ashley Young was let go as well in the same age group. There's a few other great players that didn't make the cut there. How did you personally take that news? How did you handle it and deal with it? Do you know what? I probably, I think like anything, James, when you're you're at a club, you you, you know where you're going with, with your career. So it, you know, I think you know if you're going to get a contract or you know if you're not. So I was probably through sleep wise just I weren't with it really to be honest and the last year at Watford was was very very poor um I, I was I, what you got to remember as well I was asthmatic and and I had severe asthmatic uh, asthma as a kid so I was on really strong steroids as a kid but what that done that stunted my development a little bit so I was two years behind everyone so at 16 I was probably more like a 14 year old body wise I was five foot nothing skinny as anything, not a leg running me. So I knew what was coming at Watford. So we actually forced their hand. And it's, it's really strange. I've, I've always been, as a player, I'm not like it's a manager, which is really strange, but as a player, I always had to be sort of the big fish in the small pond. And that's probably why I didn't really kick on as a player. So for me, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I was, I was buzzing. I'd go back to my Sunday team, be the best player in the team, love scoring goals, have a load of fun and try and make it as a professional. I don't know what was going through my mind. And I can only guide kids now on, on where I went wrong. But back then, that's what it was like. And that's what I wanted to be like. Um, and, and at the same time, I've always said this, my dream was to be a manager as well. So it was, I didn't handle it that bad. What I handled bad was probably like, I went to culture star and it was a great opportunity for me. They were looking for someone like myself. I actually did play well, but maybe something come across not so well that they didn't take me because I didn't I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to have to go and stay in digs. It would have killed me, literally. I would have probably lasted about three days um, because I wasn't mature enough and, and ready enough to what I was going through with the OCD as well, which, listen, that never got sorted till I said probably eight years ago now. So it was... Um, it was uh, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't ready physically or mentally at the time. How was your family like, in particular your dad, with the news that you wasn't going to make it at Watford, that, that that career path and that route wasn't available? That it, it was okay, but you know, dad won't mind me. I don't think he'll mind me saying this. He won't mind me saying what I'm not, not too fussed to be honest with you. I was suffering at the time, so but he was very much that he was he was managing at the time. He had a full time job. Um, he, he, you know, he's always said you, you've got to go and make your own career. He can't do it for me, and I and I say it to anyone now. I'm going through it with someone at the moment. I can't, I can't make you go and do what you're going to go and do at a pro club. It's up, it's up to you. I can give you the guidance and the help. He always said to me at 14, 15, you've got to work harder. You've got to do more. You've got to go out more. You've got. I, I was late. I, I think I was lazy. You know, part of me again was was suffering probably and not knowing what I was going through. And it was always laughed off in my family about what was happening with me and what I was doing and me checks. And, you know, I laugh about it myself. It's crazy, you know, two hours to go to bed. That's not normal behaviour. But at the time, it probably, you know, no one knew anything about what OCD was or what I was going through. So, you know, he he was he was, he was was fine. You know, he, he, he still supported me, still come to every game. He still come to all my Sunday games. He... You know, he gave me my debut at 15 at Harlow Town with a men's team because I was a, you know, I was a good player, but I, I probably lacked half a yard of pace um, and, I, and I didn't work hard enough as a, as a player. But, you know, he was still supportive in his own little way. You know, me and my dad have got, we're like best friends, but we never tell each other how well we're doing. It's the, it's the weirdest, it's the weirdest relationship ever. You know, it, it'll have a great result and I'll ring him up and see what he's up to. It's, you know, it's one of them, but... You know, he, he was always supportive of me, and I'd be totally wrong to say otherwise. He took me all up and down the country. Um, but, you know, it was one of them. I said to you, I, I felt that we forced Watford's hand at the time. I was never going to get a um, uh, a scholar uh, at the time because I wasn't good enough. And, and and that's what the bottom line was. And, you know, it just, it just didn't work for me at that time. After the Colchester incident, what happened next? What was your next protocol? 
probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I, I went to a uh, a college scheme. So it was, um, well, funny enough, it was, so I went to Stevenage Football Club and they, they didn't have an academy, they had a college scheme. So you would train in the, in the morning, do your college work in the afternoon and, you know, the club get funding for that. And, and, and believe it or not, I, I didn't get in. You know, there's loads of lads on trials and I was head and shoulders above a lot of them who did get in and I, I never got in. Um, I, and I was like, literally, I had, I had nothing. And no, give up at school at 15, just refused to go. Uh, I've got sort of ADHD and that. So I'd love my drama. I'd love my PE, but didn't go to any other lessons. Dad couldn't get me into school. I just rebelled, didn't want to go. And he said, don't problem, don't go. So I had nothing to come out with. And there was another scheme running alongside um, Stevenage at the time. And it was um, under a guy called Malcolm Allen and Dave Reddington. Now, Malcolm Allen was an ex-footballer, uh, played for Newcastle. And Dave Reddington is now assistant manager at Crystal Palace. Uh, Dave was 19, 20, and Malcolm was sort of 35 at the time. And I had a trial and he picked me straight away. And probably the best two years footballing... I'd had it was it was fantastic. It was up the road from my house. Malcolm, what he's done in his career, but he was he was mad. I grew up in, in two years. I loved every single minute of it. It was fantastic and just great people. And funny enough, I ended up the, the, the skins run alongside each other, and I ended up playing the majority of my time in the Stevens side because that was really where I should have been. But they 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 didn't notice me. I must have been that bad at the time. I must have been completely gone. But Malcolm sees something in me uh, and he got he got so much out of me. You know, I was the best player. I was the top lad in the group and I, I loved it. It was, a, it was a great two years. Is this after this? Is this when the, the opportunities of non-league started arising? Yeah, I was obviously fortunate again. And, and, and this is where, listen, dad has, has never given me a leg up. And he's, he's my worst, my worst critic. He really was. He was a nightmare. But I always had that in. In I knew non-league because of what I'd watched all the other years. And this is where um, I think non-league football is now starting to get a reputation for bringing players into, into the football league. But not many people knew about non-league. No one knew that you could go and earn money. I speak to young lads now, like kids, and they talk about the Premier League and they talk about Championship and League One, League Two, but they don't know about non-league. And I say, we well, do know, you know, if you... You don't make it there. You can go and earn yourself a few hundred quid a week by, by doing non-league football. And they're like, oh, wow. And so I was really in a good place. So I knew that once I finished that scheme, I could then go and start trying to find my journey into non-league football. And dad always said it. He'd always say to me, he said, like, you can go and play it. He said, but you're not going to peak till 24. And, and I didn't really understand that. And I must have had some desire, James, to be honest with you, because I sat on the bench for two, three years. Like I'd get opportunities, but I wasn't I wasn't fully developed in my man's body. But I loved football. So, you know, I'd sit on the bench, I'd you know, whatever club it'd be at, I'd get an opportunity. I might play 20 minutes here, I'd sit on the bench. I remember my one first big sort of club I went to, I went to Boreham Wood. Um must have been about 22. And I got in the first team and I sat on the bench for 10 games in a row, didn't get one minute, but just kept doing it, kept doing it. I then got an opportunity to go to another club and I said to the, the manager at the time, a good, nice guy, Steve Cook, I said, look, Cook, I think I'm going to go. He went, well, listen, we've got an injury. He said, I'm going to start you Saturday. And uh, I'm still a boy. Like, I, was, I look, but I'm still a boy. I had the worst body you've ever seen in your life. Like, I've never lifted the weight in my life. I probably couldn't have lifted a polo. It was terrible, but it gave me an opportunity. And um, but I scored two on my debut. Like I couldn't believe it. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I scored two on my debut. Um, we then went to to Chelmsford away, and uh, and he started me again. And now I'm playing against proper players. Like and and I've given it a big one one day to to the centre half and try to give him an elbow. He's about six foot four, and that's me. Like a stick man. I try to give him an elbow. The geese has done me. Like I couldn't walk for days. Um, so I learned a lesson very quickly at that, that stage. But, you know, I just, I was very patient. And this is the problem nowadays with, with a lot of footballers. They're very impatient. And I stuck at it and stuck at it and ended up having a half decent non-league career. I should have had a better one, in, in my opinion. 
I should have kicked on, probably lacked a little bit of belief. What I don't do now in management, I've got a lot of belief in management, but as a footballer, I always like being that big fish in a small pond and uh, it's probably a detriment to me in the end. But um, I ended up having a half-decent career. But for, for me, for being patient, it really was. Non-league's brilliant. Obviously, a lot of the lads are really working hard during the day and then playing their football around their working careers. You've got, obviously, other lads that are looking to go from non-league into the professional route. How, how did you handle the, the non-league environment? How did you handle that going from the academy life where everything's kind of professional to, to non-league, where the pitches are going to be different, the, the changing facilities is different? How did you handle everything that goes along with non-league? I, I love it. I, I, you've got to imagine, for me, I, I've been brought up in non-league football, and I said to you before, if I was at what, and this is where it's wrong, if I was at Watford and Dad had a game... I'm going to dad's game over going training and playing. I was I grew up in the changing rooms and this is where it's quite funny. So mentally I was years ahead of everyone else because I'm listening to the worst jokes, the worst banter. I'm seeing things that you shouldn't be seeing. It's all going off. So I'm there mentally in terms of I was far ahead, but physically in that I just wasn't there as a kid. So, you know, and as a footballer, so I, I was, it, it didn't affect me. And, 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 and I think it's just such a good ground in non-league football. And, but the problem was I was, I ended up being probably, you know, in the changing room, I was a laugh a minute and, and a bit of a class clown in there, especially as a player. You know, I was the one who was always laughing, joking, messing about, um, you know, and I've done a lot of growing up, especially when you become assistant manager and a manager, you really have to pull yourself away from that. Um, but you know, for me, I, I was a I was a nightmare. You know, it was uh, it it was madness. But I think because of that, you know, listen, I get a lot of lads coming now, and they are, you know, wet behind the ears with the changing rooms. You know, they've never seen anything like it. Especially these boys come out of pro clubs, and this is why it's so good to get loans and that because it gives you a really good grounding uh, non-league football. But they're not used to it. But I was very fortunate that I'd grown up in it, so I'd seen it. You know, I remember. I must have been 10, 11. I'd heard a joke the night before on a Tuesday in the changing room. I don't really understand the joke, but all I know is probably the rudest joke you've ever heard. I can't even remember it now. I've got and told the teacher the next day in school. <laughs> He's rang up my dad. <laughs> He's had to come up for a meeting. Like, where's this kid getting these jokes from? He's not normal. So, you know, listen, but... I wouldn't have changed it for the world. No, any honestly, give me an opportunity at Watford again, and I'd probably done exactly the same because I love the the other side. I'd love going to the football. I'd love going into the change rooms and watching Dad work and and being in around that environment. And that's why I believe where I am today is is what I want to do. Did you always have one eye on coaching and management, even when you're playing at non-league? Because I know you grew up watching your dad manage and being around that environment did you always have that that mindset that it was something you were going to do i'd say from 14 all i've ever wanted to be as a manager not not football i love playing football but i've always wanted to be a manager i've always wanted to go down that that route you know from as far as at 16 playing football manager and get me first pc for christmas and I think it was 90, 96, FIFA, uh, Football Manager 96. I'm on it for hours upon hours and I'm trying to tell Dad about his team. And you know, I've probably drove him mad and, and he'll tell you, like... Just like want to help. Probably the so, greatest game. Probably the greatest game ever invented. The best. Back at Yoko. Championship you Manager Series in that period. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, listen, I was, I'm up till five in the morning because I couldn't go out because I didn't want to do the check. So I just play Football Manager. Um, but, you know, from... From my point of view, I mean, I probably drove... I look back now and I probably drove my old man insane with like, trying to talk about his team. And and, and you know, I'm going in my room and trying to sort his team out. I'm, I'm only probably 20 years of age, 19. You know, I'm everything was geared up to be a foot. I believe is to be geared up to be a football manager. You know, I'd, I'd never... I've got such a different mindset of being a manager and where I want to go with being a manager to what I wanted to do as a player. And maybe this is my pathway and, and maybe that's why I didn't work hard enough and why I didn't put enough effort in. You know, I think 29, I probably took football. I've always taken, listen, 
I've had one night out probably on a Friday night before a game. I had one Thursday night out and it was a heavy night out. And on the Saturday, I was terrible. I'd never go out before football. I took my football so serious as a player. I, I, I treated everybody. I prepared properly. But I'd never done the other side of the game that's involved now with the fitness side, the, the, the weight side, the gym inside. I'd done that from probably 29 and that was probably too late. But I'd never had the infu. I'd probably never believed I could go on. And a lot of football now is all about a belief. I've got a totally different mindset as a manager than I had as a player. And, and probably as a player, I never really believed I could get there because it was hard work. And I didn't really like working that hard, if, if I'm honest, you know, until I was sort of 29, 30. But by then you're past it. So, but I'm, when I'm saying that my whole goal was to be a manager, yes, it was. But I loved playing. I, I'd, I'd play for free. I, I, you didn't have to pay me if you didn't want to. I'd still turn up. I remember being at one club. And we were six weeks behind on the money. I'm still there. I'm still playing. It didn't bother me. You know, the missus is going mad at home because she needs the wages in. But I was, I was still doing that. Um, so I did take it very, very serious as a player, but never kicked on to the where I wanted to go as a manager, if you know what I mean. What was your first opportunity in management, in coaching? So it was uh, at Biggleswade Town. So I I signed for them from Olsey Town. Um, we got promoted at Olsey. Um, and then we had a year in the Southern Prem. Probably going into... A, when I was at Olsey, I'm just going off the record here before going to management. But when I was at Olsey, we, we got a really good team. We moved forward and we got a lot of big egos at the football club. Good players. But again, I just get swallowed up in that at the time as a player. So I went to Biggleswade Town. Um, and, and the gaffer was, he's just great. He was great for me. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine now. We talk all the time. Um, and, and I played for him for, for two and a half years. But I, I, I kept getting an injury in my groin. I couldn't shake it off. And, and the, the last season we played there, it was a, it was a really poor season. Um, and, and I was probably going to drop down a level and just enjoy playing. Um, and, and he rang me, he said, look, he said, I've seen what you do. He said, I think you'll be a great assistant manager for me. Um, would you consider it? It'd be like a player assistant manager role. I said, yeah, as long as we go down the route of, of no massive ego, we want workers. And he went, no, I totally agree. We went out and done our homework and, and he wasn't there for the first four games and we won three and drew one. And you can imagine what I'm like. I'm on cloud nine at the time because I'm, I think now I'm the manager, I'm the gaffer. But it was what I wanted to do. And he gave me a great experience. He, he let me in charge of all the sessions. Um, he'd done his managing side. Um, and, and that's where the journey kind of started. And that was, what was that now? I think that was five, uh, just over five years ago. Do players have agents in non-league football? Is yeah. there any big-time Charlies that turn up with yeah. their agents and stuff for contract? Don't get me started. No, yeah, there is, and 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 it's changing rapidly. Football um, and and agents, and it's a very tough one because I believe you should have an agent if you're progressing and and doing really well, um, and I believe you should have an agent if you're if you're going into you know the, maybe the conference or the football league. But to have an agent try and do a deal with me is 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 sounds crazy, and but there are there are a lot and. Listen, this is the problem I feel with non-league football at times is, is, is losing that non-league feel about it. But you do have to deal with them. There are agents. There's some really good guys out there that I deal with, some great guys. There's not so good ones who will give real terrible advice. Um, but my advice is if you want to kick on, you know, don't worry about money. That will come. You know, play, do well, and the rest of it follows. It's as simple as that. What's the most unrealistic demand you've had from a player? that wanted to sign or you wanted to sign for the club? Right. I've got I've got one lad and he won't mind me saying, but it was when we was at St Albans, um, he, 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 we went and met him and he said, well, he said, well, I want to keep you. We, he played for us a year before. He was on half decent though. We thought we'd pump him up another 50 quid. He come out with, he said, look, he said, um, I've had a think about it. And um, I want, I think it was about, we were near the 300 mark and he wanted 700, right? 
So I said, what do you mean he wants seven? I think Dad said, what, what do you mean he wants 700 quid? He went, yeah. He said, I've decided I'm going to give up my job. Uh, I'm going to find a wife and I want you to pay me that money. <laughs> we looked at each other, me and my old man, and I thought, is he all right? And he was he was being a hundred percent serious. And we said, my old man said, Well, fortunately, we can't, you know, listen, we can't. And we actually lost him for about another 30 quid up the road in the end. But I was like, that was just the worst like thing he'd ever said. Like, and he weren't that way inclined, but he'd obviously really thought about giving up work, taking that as his full-time job, and finding a wife. I don't think he's got a wife to this day, actually. He's still a good friend of mine. He still ain't got a wife. So I don't know what he's doing with himself. But that was the advice at the time. I couldn't believe it. What's it like with the officials in non-league? You're seeing the same refs week in, week out? Or is it a case of different officials for different games, different areas? Yeah, you get different areas, different officials. I mean, I think, you know, when you go to like Truro, it's always tough because they're always down that way, the referees and the officials. I try, I try not to get onto them too much, if I'm honest. You know, I don't like confrontation with them. And I, and I do believe it's natural, natural human nature that, listen, if you're going to keep shouting at me and doing my head in and calling me all names, I'm going to turn on you at some point. And, you know, not that they're going to give a penalty for no reason at all, but if they did that half a split decision where it could be a penalty, it could not. If I've been screaming and shouting at him for the last half hour... I think he's going to go and give that that decision. So I think it's really important that, you know, you try and befriend them, you try and be polite and, and nice and, you know, you don't give them too much jip because I do think they go against you. And, you know, you get a reputation of, I don't want to go there, he don't stop at me all game. So it's trying to, to get a reputation of, like, he's a nice guy, he does things right. And listen, without referees and officials, we haven't got a game of football. So we have to be careful where we go with it. And listen, there's some out there that probably aren't good enough at, at some times and there's some very good ones. But I just think, you, listen, do I want someone to keep hurling abuse at me when I'm trying to do something that I'm been put in charge to do? Do you know, do you know what I mean? He's been put in charge to do a job. He's, hopefully he's doing the best he can. Listen, what, do you know what gets me the most? What does me the most is, is the tackles that, people really go over the top to try and hurt someone and they get a yellow card or nothing happens, but you kick a ball away and you get a yellow card. Yeah. They're the ones that do me. That's what does me. That's what gives me the ump, you know, because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we're non-league football. And when someone's been done like that and there hasn't been repercussions, he's got to go to work Monday morning. You know, he might have broke his leg in two places because of a terrible tackle and the referees aren't up to scratch or don't know the game and see that tackle. Do you know what I mean? You, you see some tackles where someone wins the ball, but you know what his intentions are when he's done that tackle. When you've played the game, you know. And sometimes I think the referees, because they haven't played it or they don't know it, they don't see it. And and that's sometimes a little bit of a gripe of mine. Now, like everything, you're going to get some really gifted players at that level. Potentially at that level, because they haven't got the right temperament. They're not the right mindset. They can't control their their anger issues. You must have come across some lunatics in a non-league game. Come across some lunatics, some some great players, some 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 fantastic people, some not so nice people that you think of are your friends. Um, it's it's a it's a great it's a great place, but it could be a horrible place at the same time, and it, it could be a dangerous place. You know, you've seen some things go on now in in terms of. What, what happens after football, sometimes it's not left on the pitch anymore. And that's a, that's a real concern and a worry to me. Yeah, it does, you know, you, you get some bad people. But overall, do you know what? I think it could outweigh the bad. There's some, some fantastic people in it. But in terms of talents, I, I, I've got a few boys with me now and they can go as far as they want to go with the right temperament and the right people around them. And this is what I struggle sometimes some managers, and rightly so, will always be out for their, their own game, which is absolutely fine. But some managers want to see these boys progress. And my argument is if they're doing really, really well, my team's going to be doing really, really well because they're putting the effort in. That then will kick them on. But it might kick my team on as well. And that's what's really important. And like anything, I've got, like I said, there are three or four fantastic talents that can really go and kick on. But like anything, James, if if 
I can only give advice and 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 I'd say to him, you know, I asked, I'll ask a question and I asked this question to someone close to me the other day. What do you want to be? I want to be a professional footballer. What time do you go to bed? No, two in the morning. Don't waste my time. You know, it's as simple as that. Don't waste my time. Because if you're not going to do things right off the pitch, you're not going to get where you want to go on the pitch. On the pitch takes care of itself if everything off the pitch is right. And, and these boys at my football club and other football clubs, if they get the right thing off the pitch, and this is what annoys me, some of these kids are so talented, they take their talent for granted and think that's what's enough that's going to get them there. But you'll take the less talented kid who works his nuts off and does everything right and doesn't let you down and is always there for you and you can call upon him anytime. They're the ones you're going to take. And I wish that these boys with the talent don't just rely on that and get that built into them and, and you've got some fantastic look at the people that have gone from non-league into football you know there's so many more of them where they come from um, and hopefully these boys can take the advice and, and really start to kick on Very interesting point I was just going to come into this we've seen Jamie Vardy for instance Mikel Antonio who have come the non-league route haven't had that traditional traditional experience coming through the football league are these guys held in high esteem amongst non-league players the likes of Antonio, the likes of Vardy. Are these guys the benchmark, if you like? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, it's not just them boys anymore. I think you're seeing every season now more and more players go from non-league football to the Football League. But again, I, I go back to that will always... In academies now, you've got to be careful because so many people are wrote off at 14, 15, 16... I'm a believer in if the quality's there at 14, 15, 16, but they might be going for a growth spur or it might not be right off the pitch. Or sometimes if you take a chance with them boys, they come good at 18, 19, 20. And this is where non-league football becomes really good because if we don't lose them out the game and they stay in it and we get them into non-league, they they grow into their man's body. They become a man. They become a, their quality and the mind's still there. So we write these boys off, but then they go in non-league, they work really hard, then they get back into the football league. And this is where non-league's great. The problem is we write players off, they have no real good guidance. They go from club to club to club to club to club. They don't get anywhere, they just drop out the game and they waste. Or they just, you know, look at the they've not got a chance of getting there ever again. So they go and play for their mates team, or they just don't work hard enough anymore and rely on just their quality. There's an opportunity now in non-league where if you go away and you believe in your quality and you've got it, you work really, really hard. You're going to get picked up. You get so many scouts and that of games now because they're always looking for that next Jamie Vardy. Why do you think there's a reluctance or been a reluctance in the past for Premier League, Championship, Division One, Division Two clubs to pay decent money to non-league clubs for players? When a non-league club has developed a player like for your club, for instance, if you've developed a player over two or three years, why is there a reluctancy to pay that club rather than try to take a player for free? It's wrong, and, and I don't know who's the answer. And I think that because I think they look down their noses at, at some non-league clubs, and that's a that's a concern, you know. And, and for me, you look at we had um, the lad Junior Marais at, at St Albans and Peterborough. Well, They've done it so professionally. They come to the club first. We let, we let them go in and train. They then come and done a deal with us. And the deal was very good. We got a pre-season friendly out of it. But then you go to other clubs and they're, you know they're talking to a player and they're waiting for them to run their contract down so they can get them for free of charge. I mean, you've got the rule now, if you're under 24 and you've been on contract, you can ask for some money. But some clubs don't like to pay it and, and they see it as an easy way of getting a good player without paying the money, which is wrong because, like you say, we've spent time to develop these players, look after the players, bring them to where they are now and you just need a little bit of recognition. And you know, If you actually look here, a lot of clubs aren't asking for bundles of money either. They just want maybe a pre-season, maybe a little bit of money on top, maybe a low need that they can get in from the club by looking after the... But unfortunately... This is the sport that we're in and this is football and, and it does go underhanded at times and it's wrong, but, you know, it is what it is. From my football manager, championship manager days, what I would recommend is obviously adding a percentage of the sell-on clause. So even if, you're getting, like, if you've got 30% yeah. in the future, that could that could be a year's yeah, wages for a small club. 100%. I think if you look at a few clubs now that 
I think the lad Jamal Lara at Swansea has got, you know, where he come from Hampton, there's there's clauses in there that they've they've earned a little bit of money on every move he's got. And why why not? They've developed this kid through he getting released, not really finding a club, to going to Hampton, to doing really, really well, to now being playing in the championship and nearly, you know, he's up there with the promotion teams and, and they're getting rewarded for that. And that's how it should be. These non-league clubs look need looking after because they soon these Premier these these professional clubs soon want you to look after their low knees and give them the experience. But when it's the other way around and they want to take your player, if they don't do it right, that doesn't sit well. And and you hope that they do do it right and they've got morals and and you can then build relationships through that. And hopefully, it I think it's changing more and more now. And you're seeing so many more players kick on through the. Um, through to the football league, that you're seeing more and more clubs rewarded for what they're doing. What's your long-term aspirations as a manager? What are your goals? What are your targets? What do you want to achieve in management? I think, firstly, you know where I'm at the moment. I wanna, I wanna complete a, a full season in terms of I haven't completed one yet from where I've been. But I want, I, you know, if, if it's at Hendon, I wanna kick on as much as we can and push the club to to where we, I believe we can go. And and I want to push on as a manager. I've never made any secret that I want to manage in the Football League. You know, why why not? You know, I really hope that by me saying that I've got, you know, I've had OCD and, and you know, that I'm not, I've got a stigma to that and, and it doesn't stop me progressing because why? Would you want me to lie and make out everything's great and happy and, you know, there's no issue and then find out actually I have. I, I'm open. I'm an open book and, you know, I really hope that by me coming out and saying what I've suffered with in the past and, you know, I still have occasions where I don't feel great, that everyone's in that book. But why I keep making out that everyone's great? If you've got an injury on your leg, you get treated for it. If you don't feel great mentally, you should be able to be treated for it. So I really hope that by me opening up doesn't stop me progressing in, in football. I really, really hope that. But if it does, then maybe it, it's, it's the wrong thing for me and the wrong sport for me. So, you know, but... I, I want to kick on. I, I, I've made no secret of that. The, the club know how ambitious I am, but I'm at a fantastic football club. I really, really am at good people, great, great club, great history. And I want to take Hendon as far as I can. And I want to progress up the, up the managerial ladder um, and, and, and try and, I'll say, you know, get into the football league. Why not? You know, I want to dream that. That's what I want to be. And, and I believe I'll get there. We're in a generation now where it's okay not to be okay. It's fully acceptable for someone to speak about an issue, a problem or something they've dealt with in the past. I know when you was a youngster coming through football, that stigma wouldn't have been the same. But now we're in a, we're in a place where people do have problems. It's fully acceptable for someone to be struggling with something and to work their way through that. And I think football in general is a changing place. So I'm, I'm hoping that that has a good effect for yourself in the future, leads yourself onto another career journey. Yeah, I really hope so, because, you know, it doesn't change. Listen, I've got a complete different mentality as a manager as a player. You know, no one that I, I will work harder than what I will. I study day and night, and I'm not trying to sell myself here. Like, this, you know, I, I'll, it is what it is, but I'm just saying how I am. And I really hope it doesn't, and, and only time will tell. And I think, you know, I'm an open book. Ask me questions. And I've never really come out. If, if you'd have seen me as a player, I was a local laugh, the joke, you know, we're always laugh a minute. And, you know, anyone that knew me would think I was absolutely normal and fine. Well, yeah, I am. But I've just got a few little issues that I'm dealing with. And, you know, I, I've never really put it out there because I find when people put it out there, people have judgments all the time. Why do we always judge everyone all the time? Why can't we be, be, be a society that want to help each other and, and be pleased for each other? You know, I, I, it's so wrong. And, you know, I, I believe people don't come out and talk sometimes because they worry what everyone else is saying. Well, unfortunately, I don't really care no more. If you can believe me or not believe me, I'm not really that fussed. Like, I've had my problems. Anyone close to me knows that. And 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 it is what it is. And I have to uh, live with that. As I say, I've, I was very fortunate in meeting um, uh, Dean Hooper and Dominic Sterling in, in September. What, what two people they are, you know, Dean is, is just breathtaking, his story and Dominic is, is great at what he does and, and they've helped me massively and 
I'm in, I'm in a really good place. I've been in a good place for a few years now. You know, I have my moments. I don't like losing. I take losing very, very badly at times. Um, and, and I'm working on that. But I'm in a good place. And, um, you know, thanks to them guys and good people. And I want to be able to share this today and my story because it wasn't normal growing up taking two hours to, to go to bed every night. It wasn't normal walking three miles one way to move a trolley and three miles back. But, but living with that and thinking it's normal, it's it's, hard, it's horrible. And, and I don't actually know how I've done it. You know, it, it, it's tough. And anyone who suffers like that or has any form of OCD, and, you know, OCD doesn't just come out in that. It comes out in, you know, thoughts. You know, you can obsess your thoughts that go on for days and weeks. And, you know, you can't get it. If you're suffering, speak out because it, it, it will help you, um, you know. It does annoy me, and I'll be honest, when people say, I've got a bit of OCD, and I love keeping things tidy. Listen, there's nothing to do with keeping things tidy. You know if you've got OCD or not, because it, it takes it can take over your whole life, and, it, and it's very, very scary, and you have to be in control of that. Um, as I say, I've been on top of it now for a long, long time. A lot of people suffer with it, and it's okay to say, look, listen, I'm, I'm struggling. It's okay to say that. There's nothing wrong with saying that. You shouldn't be judged. You shouldn't be... Um, you know, look at footballers now frightened to come out. Why? So bad. You get injured. I said this a minute ago. If you get injured in your body, you get it treated. But if you say you've got something not feeling right in the head, you, you're judged on it or man up or that's not right. And and hopefully now, like you just said, we, it's really slowly changing. People aren't being so judgmental on it. And um, it, it's OK not to be OK at times. And we can move forward with that. Yeah, I would just like to mention as well, football flow. Because the Premier League players and the league players seem to get a lot more support than the non-league players. So I think it's a great thing that Dean Hooper and his partner are doing with Football Flow. Just to just to be a voice for some of the players that haven't got the resources, haven't got that, them therapists on hand or whoever else. Like you say, the, the mind is a really funny thing. So I think it's a great thing that Dean and the team are doing. And I wish him much success with it. I really do. Absolutely. And listen, you know more than anyone. You've, you've listened to Dean and, and the guy's amazing. But I have to say as well, because I've been a big advocate for, for football flow. And I don't don't think that you have to come out and talk about you, you've you spoken to football flow. Don't feel that any conversations you have get out anywhere. They are two very, very good people who look after just you when you're in that, that moment. You know, they're not looking for recognition. I just believe where I am, I'm open, I'm honest. I'd like to say what would have helped me. And they have been a massive help. But if anyone's thinking of getting in touch, don't be fearful that oh, I might have to tell a story or I might have to give... No, it, everything's private. Nothing's ever been shared. It was my decision to come on here. It was my choice to talk about them. It's my choice to speak about them in the non-league paper because they've been a great help for me and my family. And I... They're there for you. We've just said it there. There's no support network for non-league players who suffer. And it might not be suffering. You know, it might be gambling. It might be drug addiction. It might be drinking. They can put you in touch with the right people. It might be an eating condition. It might be OCD. We've all got these problems and there's people out there that are suffering. Don't be fearful of getting in touch and they'll put you in with the right people. And it's totally confidential, which is great. You know, it was my choice to come out and talk about these people because I believe in non-league football, these should be recognised for what they're doing. And hopefully now they will get that recognition and help more and more people. Yeah, I think what Dean's doing is fantastic. He was brilliant in When Saturday Comes as well. I thought that was a top draw performance from Dean Hope. I really did. <laughs> no, he's, a, he's a great guy. And um, he, he, he just, listen, he put out yesterday that he was signed for Swindon after four years of being put into a padded cell in a straitjacket and sectioned. Anyone who didn't believe they could achieve something, after what he'd done, you can achieve anything in life. That's a fact. And if you believe in it and you say it enough, it will happen. And as I say, don't be frightened to say it. Keep saying it and you'll get where you want to get to. It's 100% true. If you are interested in watching Dean Hooper's story, we've got a two-part special with him on the channel which was a great pleasure to film. And he was in good form as well. Very, very honest. I've got to say, Lee, it's a great pleasure to get you on the channel today. Thank you ever so much for sharing a bit of your story with us. I know there's a lot no. more stuff that we haven't touched on, but um, I, feel, I thank you very much for sharing what we have so far.
No, thank you for having me on, mate. Absolute pleasure to come on and um, thank you for giving me the platform to share what you know I've suffered with and, and hopefully it will help others come out and, and talk about what they're, what they're struggling with. Indeed. Thank you ever so much for your time today, Lee. I look forward to thank catching you, you up again soon. And um, yeah, you're a top man. Thank you ever so much. Definitely. Thank you, mate.